So we spent a lot of time looking at the psych chart, and I just want to take a minute to, to recognize that it, that will be one of the primary tools looking at a lot of commercial HVAC systems that you might in an RCX process. But that's one of a few types of saturated systems that we're going to look at. So the field of psychrometrics really looks at saturated air systems at temperatures that we might expect them to be you know, in our buildings outside. But it is a saturated system in the sense that we're dealing with air containing liquid at different phases. So it starts as a vapor and train in the air, and then if we're in a, say, cooling process, we're reaching saturation so that we can condense that water out to get it out of the air. So there's other systems that, uh, that we can think about having materials at different phases. And the two I'm going to point out here are steam systems and refrigerant systems and the different diagrams and equations that, that govern those systems. So to start out, uh, David Sellers on his blog has a really good walkthrough about how we have these systems in our lives that we may not think of them as multi-phase saturated systems. We just may call it a steam kettle. But what David did was put some instrumentation uh, against his steam kettle to look and see, to, to, to track what, what's happening as he's heating up a a pot of water for tea. So you can see in the purple is the wattage for his stovetop. So you can see when his stove's going on and off. And then in the red and the blue and the dotted green are is different sensors looking at the temperature of the water. And then of the vapor, the air inside the, uh, the steam kettle. So a, a, an important thing to note here is that as the temperature rises, it gets to the boiling point of water that we know to be at atmospheric pressures 212 degrees Fahrenheit and then it just sits there. There's still energy going into that water, the stove's still on, but it's sitting at that temperature. And that's a, a very key point to talk about when we're examining saturated systems like steam and different refrigerant systems, is that in order to accomplish a phase change it takes energy. It's going to sit at that temperature until it completes its phase change. And that's, a, that's very key in how we use those systems to manage loads and pass loads around from one system to the next. So it's, it's easy to think about a time series of a steam kettle and what we need to do is be able to transfer that thought process to these diagrams that, that we use in engineering where we're looking at say a, a pH diagram which stands for pressure and enthalpy. So if we plot pressure versus enthalpy we can see other things like that constant temperature line at that boiling point of 212 degrees and we can look at different properties of the of the the water or the steam at those at those places. So we're going to go into the diagram a little bit more detail in terms of how to read it, but for now I'm just going to point out that when we look at phase change diagrams, there's typically these three sections where we're looking at subcooled or liquid on the left, superheat or straight vapor, dry vapor on the right, and then what's called the vapor dome. So inside that dome, the material in this case the uh, the the steam of the water it's it's going to be in this state of flux where it's going to be in, in a various stages of saturation before it either gets to the superheat and just heats up the dry vapor or the gets to the subcooled liquid phase and is just he heating or cooling the liquid so we can start to think about cycles and that, that's really how we how we use these these phase change processes is in cycles. So this is what a steam radiator cycle might look like, where you start by pumping water into a boiler, you heat it up, accomplish that phase change, send it out to a radiator where it's going to grab that heat, and as it's grabbing that heat and sending it into the space, the steam is going to start condensing down to a point where it's then going to get pumped back to the boiler and start the whole process again. That's the same thing in refrigeration cycles. We're just reversing the direction there. So instead of starting with liquid and heating it up to a point where we get to vapor, we're starting from the other side where we're going to go through a compressor where we're pressurizing and it's going to heat the refrigerant up a little bit. It's going to condense as you get rid of this, some of that heat and through some processes of expanding the refrigerant it's then cooled and ready to go through, say, an evaporator in a space 
we're just going to pick up that heat and phase change at a constant temperature whereby it's going to start the whole process again at the compressor. So when we say refrigerant, I just want to stop and make that definition really quickly. We're talking about any substance that has the properties such that it can be leveraged or harnessed in a refrigeration cycle to support this cyclical evaporation and condensation, preferably in a way that's not going to set anything on fire, not going to hurt anybody, and it's going to have pressures that we're going to be able to maintain. So a couple examples include these materials that you may see in HVAC, but I'll point out that the ones that we may talk about or the ones that are fairly common to see out there are the ones that aren't being phased out and the ones that uh, are going to be in a lot of AC systems, chillers, and that's R134A and R410A. So really the place that we want to get to is, is looking at the equipment and understanding how those how those systems work and what components are needed to accomplish those phase changes. So that's where we're going to go with the next lesson.